Chapter One: What is a desert? A desert is a dry place that has less than twenty-five centimeters of rain every year. Some deserts have no rain for months or years. Some deserts have sand, but others have stones or rocks. Some deserts are in the mountains. In the day, temperatures in hot deserts are usually from twenty to thirty-five degrees centigrade, but temperatures can be more than fifty degrees. At night, the air gets very cold. Sometimes it's less than zero degrees. Most cold deserts are warm in summer, but they are very cold in winter. In summer, temperatures are usually from 21 to 26 degrees centigrade. In winter, they are usually from 2 to 4 degrees. Most of the water in cold deserts comes from snow or fog. It doesn't come from rain. It snows in Antarctica, but this only makes about five centimeters of water every year. It's the biggest and coldest desert on Earth. Chapter Two: Different Deserts. More than twenty percent of the land on Earth is desert. There are many different deserts. The Sahara Desert in North Africa is the biggest hot desert on Earth. It's nine million square kilometers. That's about as big as the USA. The Sahara has sand dunes, rocks, and mountains. Some of the sand dunes are one hundred and eighty meters tall. The Sahara has very strong winds that make big sandstorms. The sandstorms can take plants and animals into the air. The Atacama Desert is in Peru and Chile. It's not very hot, and it's one of the oldest and driest deserts on Earth. It has less than one millimeter of rain every year. Scientists think that at one time it didn't rain here for four hundred years. There aren't many deserts in Europe. There's one small desert in Spain. It's called the Tabernas Desert. The Gobi Desert is in Mongolia and China. It's one million three hundred thousand square kilometers, and it's in the mountains. Most of the land is rock. It's one of the coldest deserts on Earth. In winter, the temperature can be minus forty degrees centigrade. Chapter three: Plants. Deserts are very dry places, but plants can still grow there. Desert plants collect and use water in special ways. The cactus has big roots, so it can collect water fast when it rains. It stores water in its stem for when there isn't any rain. Many cactus plants have spikes. The spikes also collect water, and they stop animals eating the plant. There are about 1,200 different types of plant in the Sahara Desert. The Welwitchia plant gets water from fog. The leaves collect the water, and it goes down into the soil. Then the plant takes up the water with its roots. The baobab tree grows in the deserts in Africa and Australia. It can store thousands of liters of water. Some baobab trees are more than nine meters across. Desert people can drink the water from this tree. The seeds of many desert plants can stay in the soil for a long time. When it rains, they grow fast and produce flowers. Then they die, but they leave seeds for the next time it rains. Chapter Four: Animals. It's hard to live in the desert. 
But deserts are homes for many different animals. Insects, like ants, can live underground when it's hot. They put their eggs underground too. Insects are important because bigger animals need them for food. Spiders and scorpions are arachnids. Many desert arachnids are poisonous. They use their poison to catch insects and other small animals. Mammals are animals that drink milk from their mother when they are young. Many desert mammals can live for days with no water because they can get water from plants. Desert jerboas make water in their body when they eat dry seeds and roots. Reptiles like snakes, lizards, and desert tortoises have a thick skin. This helps their body to save water. Most reptiles get food and water from other animals, but desert tortoises eat plants. Some deserts even have fish. Pupfish live in small rivers in the deserts in North America. Chapter Five: Day and Night. In deserts around the world, different animals come out at different times. Reptiles come out in the morning to get warm in the sun. Lizards lie on rocks to get warm. They lie in the shade when it's too hot. Desert tortoises look for food in the morning. At night, they stay in their burrows so that they are warm and safe from other animals. Many desert birds also come out in the day. In the morning, they look for spiders, insects, and seeds. Most desert animals sleep in the day and come out at night. Many small animals sleep in burrows. Bigger animals, like foxes, sleep in big holes called dens. At night, scorpions look for food. Scorpions have tiny hairs on their legs. The hairs help the scorpions to feel other animals moving. Some animals, like desert cats and owls, have special eyes to help them to see well at night. Owls can also hear very well, so they know when animals are moving. Chapter six: People. About thirteen percent of all the people in the world live in deserts. Some people lived in deserts a long time ago. Aborigines were the first people of Australia. They lived in the deserts in Australia more than forty thousand years ago. Aborigines use art to tell stories. Many Aborigines live in cities today, but some are going back to their traditional life in the desert. Tuareg people lived in the Sahara Desert more than two thousand years ago. They are called the Blue People because of the color of their clothes. Traditional Tuaregs travel across the desert on camels. They live in tents made from animal skins and wood. Many Tuaregs have farms, and others work in cities. Bedouin people lived in the deserts hundreds of years ago. They live in the Middle East and North Africa. Traditional Bedouins are traveling farmers. They live in tents or mud houses. Today, many Bedouins work in cities. Some Bedouins make and sell things. Chapter One. This is London. Every year, 
more than nine million people come from countries all over the world to visit London. They go to the theatres and museums. They look at interesting old buildings, many of them hundreds of years old. They sit or walk in the beautiful parks, or have a drink in a pub. They go to Oxford Street to look at the shops, or to Harrods. Two million visitors go to the Tower of London. A million more go to see St Paul's Cathedral. Yes, London is a big and beautiful city, with lots to see and do. But how did it all begin? Chapter Two. In the beginning. The name London comes from the Romans. There were people living here before they came, but we do not know very much about them. The Romans came to England in A.D. forty-three. They built houses and other buildings and made a town next to the River Thames. They called the town Londinium. They built a bridge over the river, and ships came up to Londinium from the sea. The town got bigger and bigger. Important new buildings went up, and you can see some of the Roman city wall today, near the Museum of London. It was a rich town. With about fifty thousand people living in it, but soon after A.D. four hundred, the Romans left Londinium to go back to Rome, and nobody lived in the town for many hundreds of years. The buildings began to fall down. Danish soldiers destroyed more buildings nearly five hundred years later. King Alfred was king of England then. He got the Danes to leave London, and his men built the town again. In 1066, William the Conqueror came to England from France to be king. Soon after, he began to build the Tower of London. When Henry the Eighth was king. In 1509, fifty thousand people lived in London again. By the year 1600, there were two hundred thousand, but a lot of them lived in old and dirty buildings. In 1665, a hundred thousand people died from an illness called the plague. This was called the year of the Great Plague. A year later, in 1666, there was a big fire, the Fire of London. It began in a house in Pudding Lane, near London Bridge. More than a quarter of a million Londoners lost their homes in the fire. It destroyed St Paul's Cathedral, and eighty-eight other churches. But the fire also destroyed most of the worst old buildings, and the new houses that went up after this were better for people to live in. A new St Paul's Cathedral was built between sixteen seventy-five and seventeen eleven. By 1881, more than three million people lived in London. Today, more than six million people live here. There were eight million in the 1960s, but in the 1970s and 1980s, people moved out of the centre of London. 
Chapter Three. Visiting the City. A quick and easy way to get to different places in the city is to use an underground train. The trains run all day and most of the night. Buy your ticket before you get on the train. It's better not to make your journey between eight o'clock and ten o'clock in the morning, or four o'clock and six o'clock in the evening. These are called the rush hours. Thousands of people are going to work or coming home again then, and it is difficult to move. Or to find a place to sit on the train. You can see much more of London from one of its famous red buses. Some special visitors' buses take you to many of the interesting places in the city on one journey. It takes about one and a half hours. But you can break your journey and get off and on again at the different places you want to visit. London taxis are called black cabs. Most of them are black, but some are not. You can stop one if it has a for hire sign on it. The drivers are usually friendly and helpful. Why not take a boat trip along the River Thames? Boats leave Westminster Pier and Charing Cross Pier, and they go to Tower Pier and Greenwich. Between April and October. You can take a longer boat trip to Hampton Court, about four hours, a beautiful palace in a big park. Chapter Four. Some places to go. The Queen has her London home at Buckingham Palace. It is at the end of the Mall. A long road that begins at Trafalgar Square. At half past eleven most mornings, the soldiers at Buckingham Palace change the guard. It takes about thirty minutes, and hundreds of visitors come to watch. And in August and September, you can usually visit some of the rooms in the palace. But there are always lots of people coming to see them, so be ready to wait. You can also visit the Royal Mews at the palace. This is the home of the Queen's horses and coaches. The Queen's gallery is also at the palace, and you can visit it at most times of the year. Here you can see pictures from all over the world. The Tower of London is now a museum, and one of London's most famous buildings. More than two million people visit it every year. Yeoman warders, also called beef eaters, tell them all about the tower. You can see the crown jewels, and visit the Bloody Tower, and the White Tower, or take a walk round the wall, and perhaps see one of the tower's famous black birds, the ravens. Tower Bridge is near the Tower of London. It is one of the most famous bridges in the city. And first opened in 1894. St Paul's Cathedral is not far away, on Ludgate Hill. It was built by Sir Christopher Wren 
after the fire of London. Wren built more than 50 London churches. Visitors can go up to the Golden Gallery to look across London. Chapter 5 Westminster Westminster Abbey is more than 900 years old and is a very famous London church. After William the Conqueror, every king and queen of England was crowned king or queen here. The Houses of Parliament are near Westminster Abbey. This is the home of the British government. The clock high up on the building is called Big Ben. The Prime Minister, the head of the British government, lives at 10 Downing Street. Walk along Parliament Street to Whitehall, past the government buildings, and you can see the little street on your left. Parks and Gardens When you are tired of looking at buildings, you can sit or walk in one of London's beautiful parks. Hyde Park has a lake in the middle called the Serpentine, and you can take a boat out on the water. It is a good place to get away from the crowds and the noise of the city. You can listen to the speakers at Speaker's Corner near Marble Arch. People from all over the world come and speak here. You can ask a speaker some difficult questions if you like, or you can stand on a box and speak to some of the listeners. Kensington Gardens is next to Hyde Park. Here you can see the statue of Peter Pan, the famous boy in the children's story Peter Pan by J. M. Barry. Regent's Park is the home of London Zoo. The zoo has thousands of birds and animals from all over the world. There is also a theatre in the park. On a summer's evening, you can sit out under the night sky and watch a play by William Shakespeare, England's most famous writer. St James's Park is next to the Mall. It is smaller, but many people think it is more beautiful. Chapter 6 Shops and Eating The most famous shop in London, some people say the most famous in the world, is Harrods in Knightsbridge. It opened in 1849. Oxford Street has many big shops. Selfridges, Marks and Spencer, John Lewis, Debenhams. There are always lots of people looking at the shops here, but at Christmas thousands more people come to see the wonderful Christmas lights and to buy things for their friends and family for Christmas. Charing Cross is famous for its bookshops. There are lots of them, and they sell old and new books. One of the oldest and most famous is Foils. It has thousands of books but it can sometimes be very difficult to find the book you want. Covent Garden was once a big food market, but now it has lots of small shops and cafes, and there are street performers to watch. There are two very famous markets in London. Petticoat Lane Market, open on Sundays, 
is in Middlesex Street and is a good place to buy cheap clothes and things for the home. At the market in Portobello Road, open on Saturdays, you can buy old clocks, old chairs and tables, and hundreds of other things. You can find food from nearly every country in the world in London. In Soho, in the West End of London, see map on pages 18 and 19. You can eat food from Italy, India, China, Japan, Greece, and lots more places. There are also thousands of pubs in the city. In many pubs, you can eat as well as drink. Or why not have some English fish and chips? They are cheap and good to eat. Or you can have tea at the Ritz in Piccadilly. Or at the Savoy Hotel in the Strand. Chapter 7 Going Out Theatres and Music London's West End has some of the best theatres in the world, so tickets can be expensive. Go in the afternoon. It is often cheaper. There is something for everybody. From a play by the Royal Shakespeare Company at the Barbican Theatre to Agatha Christie's The Mousetrap. This play began in 1952 and thousands of visitors see it every year. There are lots of cinemas to visit. The most expensive are in the West End, but you can sometimes get cheap tickets on Mondays. You can hear wonderful music and singing from all over the world at the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden, the Royal Albert Hall in Kensington Gore, the London Coliseum in St. Martin's Lane, and the Barbican Centre, Silk Street. For ballet, go to the Sadler's Wells Theatre in Rosebury Avenue or to the Royal Opera House. To get cheap tickets, buy them an hour or two before it begins. Do you like to listen to jazz musicians? You can hear some of the best at Ronnie Scott's Club in Frith Street or at the Bull's Head Barnes at Barnes Bridge or at 100 Club at 100 Oxford Street. Sport Some of the most famous English football clubs are in London. You can see Arsenal play at Arsenal Stadium, Avenal Road, N5. Chelsea play at Stamford Bridge, Fulham Road, SW6. And Tottenham Hotspur play at White Hart Lane, High Road, N17. To watch the very English game of cricket, go to Lord's Cricket Ground in St. John's Wood, NW8. This is the home of cricket for most English people. Chapter 8 Museums and Galleries The British Museum in Great Russell Street is the biggest museum in Britain. Tickets are free. The Museum of London at 150 London Wall is one of the most interesting museums in the city. It tells the story of London and its people. One more museum that tells a story is the Museum of the Moving Image, MOMI, on the South Bank, under Waterloo Bridge. This tells the story of cinema and television, and there are many things for visitors to see and do.
you can act with actors on a film set, or you can read the news on TV. Four million people visit the National Gallery in Trafalgar Square every year. They come to look at more than two thousand pictures. Tickets are free. At the National Portrait Gallery in St Martin's Place, you can see pictures of famous people. Tickets are free here too. The London Dungeon in Tooley Street is a museum of horror. Half a million people visit it every year, but they don't always stay to see it all. Madame Tussauds in Marylebone Road is famous for its people made from wax. You can see famous people from the past and famous people of today: Abraham Lincoln, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Pavarotti, Marilyn Monroe, Charlie Chaplin, Sylvester Stallone. And in the Chamber of Horrors, you can see some very bad people. Chapter Nine: Places and Parades. The City. Londoners often talk about the city. They are talking about the oldest part of London, the home of the Bank of England, and many other big offices. About five thousand people live in the city, and at weekends it feels empty. But between Monday and Friday, nearly half a million people come here to work in the banks and offices. Look for the city men, with their dark suits and umbrellas. St Paul's Cathedral is in the middle of the city. And the Bank of England has an interesting museum that you can visit. Also in the city is a very tall building, sixty point six meters high, called the Monument. Christopher Wren built this too, and it stands on the place where the Fire of London began in sixteen sixty six. Some interesting and exciting days. Every year, on a Saturday morning in June, foot guards and horse guards have a parade for the Queen. This is called trooping the colour. The colour is the flag that the soldiers carry. Thousands of people stand in the mall. To see the Queen and the soldiers go past. The exciting Notting Hill Carnival is on the last Sunday and Monday in August. There are two wonderful parades to watch: one on Sunday, and one on Monday. And you can see them going through the streets near Portobello Road, and Ladbroke Grove. On the second Saturday in November, Londoners can see their new Lord Mayor in the Lord Mayor's Show, a parade from Mansion House, the Lord Mayor's home, to the Strand. The Lord Mayor is the most important person in the city after the Queen. The first Mayor of London was Henry Fitzalan. In eleven eighty nine, they were not called Lord Mayors until the time of King Henry the Eighth. Big red buses, London policemen, Buckingham Palace, Speaker's Corner, Big Ben, Notting Hill Carnival—these are some of the things you can find in London. But there are many, many more. Come and see.